Hey, welcome to Living the Next Chapter. It's Dave. I'm happy to have you here again for another episode. My guest today at 81, 81 years of age, has released his first book, 81 Years of Age. Bruce McIntyre is with me. We're going to be talking about his journey as he sold his business that he built over the years and at the same time of selling his business battled cancer it's an amazing story Uh, what a gentleman to have on so inspirational and before we hit record and after we hit stop he just kept pouring into me as the host such a gentleman and I'm so proud to have him on the podcast Bruce McIntyre is on the podcast to talk about his journey and overcoming cancer. And what a what a sweet guy to have on the show. I hope you enjoy this. If you have somebody in your life who is battling, or you're battling, I hope you're inspired by Bruce's words today. You're on the Living the Next Chapter podcast. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Living the Next Chapter. I have probably one of the most amazing people to talk to right now here on the podcast. I got a brand new book that just came out. And uh, Bruce is here. Bruce McIntyre is with me. And we're going to be talking about writing a book, um, a memoir, and a story that's got some great stuff that's going to help all of us. I think we're going to be really inspired today. And my author today is just maybe one or two years older than I am. And I'm so excited to have him here. Bruce, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, David. So I'm not I I'm not going to give away your age, Bruce, but. When I, when you mentioned your age to me, I was so honored to have you on the podcast. Can you tell us a little bit about you and in your background, Bruce? I'd love to share with it with people listening. Well, you you mentioned age, so I'll I'll mention that up first. Um, I was born in 1941, so I'm 81 years old, um, and this is my first book. So you know, I guess the moral there is you're never too too old to try something new. Beautiful. Um, My background was corporate, uh, then owning my own business, and then in the process of selling that business, being diagnosed with cancer and having to deal with both the sale of the company and cancer at the same time. And so the memoir is really built around that. It's the uh, intermeshing of those two stories, uh, trying to deal with selling a business and treating cancer simultaneously throughout the day so that you're balancing your calendar to to do justice to both. Um, and and that can be hard when you're used to being in control. Uh, so you have to simply relinquish some of that control and let others take over. It's going to be a, a taxing time for you physically and mentally to balance the two. Like, how did you approach this in a way that you kept your your stamina to go through all these changes that were happening in a short amount of time? Well, I'm not sure I always did. Um, okay. I mean, I, I lost a lot of weight for sure. Um, because my cancer was in my throat, um, the radiation basically closed my throat. So I didn't swallow anything for over four months. Not a, not a, not a drop of liquid or a, or a bite of food went down my throat for four months. Wow. Everything came in through a feeding tube in my, in my gut. So um, really just keeping myself fed and hydrated was almost a full-time job. Um, and then making it to the radiation appointments and the infusion and so forth. And in between that, that, that was back in the day of, of blackberries. And so I would be getting treatments or infusions and, and blackberry talking to, to my attorney in Washington, D.C. about the sale. Uh, and, 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 and arguably... One kept my mind off the other, so um, I always kind of looked at it as a as a blessing because I didn't 
I didn't have any time to worry about anything. I had to just get on with it. The moment you start to worry about one thing, the other thing would raise up and you'd have to address that and you go back and forth yeah. and back and forth. Yeah. So tell me a little bit, Bruce, about the people that have been in your corner through all of this, family and friends. How important were they as you navigated the sale of your business and your health? Tell me a little bit of those, of those people who came around you and supported you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because there were many people that looked at my success in the business and said that I should be very proud. I had built this all on my own, um, rags to riches kind of story. And it became very clear to me over the years that nobody does anything on their own. We all get help from somewhere, somehow. Right. And so the credit for building the business goes to the people that, that I was fortunate enough to surround me with who built that business. Mm. Um, the, obviously, the credit for the, for the cancer treatment goes to the, to the doctors. Um, and boy, the, the oncologist and the radiation oncologist, the medical oncologist, but guys that can program a, a laser with 35 beams to hit exactly one little bad spot and not hit the others, just have an incredible mind that I can't even, can't even begin to comprehend, but they're, they're brilliant. Um, so a huge respect for them and, and everybody in healthcare. I mean, the, you know, the nurses, the technicians, um, the, the nurses in infusion who would have to find a vein every day. And, and if, you're, if you're getting IVs every day for an extended period of time, which I was not used to, um, veins do funny things. They hide, they roll over, they shrink. Um, so I had developed a tremendous respect for them and their ability to deal with, with all of that. So, yeah, I, surrounded by just hundreds of people that it would take me forever to name, yeah. uh, many, many of whose names I can't even remember, um, down to, David, the, I was able at treatment for the first half of it to drive myself, half. The, the second half my wife had to drive me. And then at the end, they had to roll me in in a wheelchair and all of that. But initially, when I would drive myself, um, they, they, they had valet service at the cancer treatment center. And a smiling face would, would park my car. And every morning for seven weeks, he was just a source of joy to me. And even when they needed to load me in the wheelchair and carry me in, he was every bit as pleasant then as mm. when, when I was handing him the keys to my, to my car. Um, so just surrounded by a tremendous number of people and and great people. Yeah. People who care more about others than themselves, and mm. and you don't see that every day in the workplace. You, you see an awful lot of people who are in it for themselves, and maybe if somebody else picks up something good. But I think in, in certain frontline professions, teaching, um, obviously healthcare, but all of the first first line responders, um, they care more about the other person than they do themselves. And I, I just think that's miraculous. So the lessons you've learned through your healthcare journey, how do you see them relating back to business? You talk about people who care and they don't have to. And you learn a lesson from watching those people demonstrate love and care for you. How do you translate that back during the sale of your business to your company and those people? You see a correlation between the two? Well, well, I do. And if I understand where your question is going, and maybe maybe I'm taking it in a different direction, but I think I think there is far too much emphasis in our society today upward within an organization and not downward within an organization. Mm -hmm. I, I don't care 
what business we're talking about until you get down on the shop floor or down at the base level. You, if I go in the grocery store, it's the person stocking the shelves and 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 cutting the meat that makes the difference. Right. Uh, every bit is the guy up in the executive suite right. planning some new ad campaign. Yeah, yeah, you're right, and I think that's. Unfortunately, in some businesses, that's the, those are the people that are not always acknowledged, you know, or recognized for their efforts. And I love yeah. the fact that you you saw that during your healthcare journey that there were people there that again that went beyond the job description, exactly. right? Exactly, and yeah. showed care. Yeah. So okay, so the book. Um, tell me a little bit about the book now and your memoir. Um, I'd love to know the title of it as well. Again, it just came out in March, so it's uh, yeah. New. the The title of the book is titled "There Are No Answers Here, Only Questions." Okay, and that title kind of came to me maybe in the second or third draft because every time I thought I was answering something, I realized I had another question. So mm. it just kept it just kept progressing. And um, I ended up saying, you know, that's not a bad title. And, and the editor agreed, and, and so it just stuck. Um, the, um, the, the story is pretty much set in the first four paragraphs because there you learn that I'm on my way to Baltimore to meet with the buyer, but I discover a lump on the left side of my throat. So in the first four paragraphs, you know, I'm ready to sell the business, but there's a lump on my throat. Yeah. So there's something going on here. So that that's designed to obviously pull the reader into the story. Um, then it's almost as though there were two decks of cards. One is the sale of the business, and the other is treating the cancer. Right. And rather than deal with all of one at one time and all of the other at the other time, we just shuffled them together so that in these short chapters, you go from selling in the business to treating the cancer to selling the business to treating the cancer. You're just hopscotching on through the story. Wow. And the minute you get depressed because you're worried that I'm not going to make it or something, uh, the next chapter is very upbeat because we're We've made some big deal in the business and things are going to be great. So you're kind of, mm. you're on this roller coaster all through the story of what's coming next. So Bruce, at what point did you decide to write the book? Well, it's a story, Dave, that I've been, you know, I've been telling little verbal snippets of it. Okay. Uh, since 2010 when it happened. And, um, you know, because people would ask this or they'd ask that. And so I developed almost a little story routine that I would I would share. Um, and then I just kept saying, you know, this is a bigger story. This is something that could be put on paper and and be something. So uh, it took about four years to write okay. and um, went through draft after draft after draft. And there are probably two or three books lying around on the floor in here somewhere <laughs> uh, that got cut out. Um, but uh, through a process with an extraordinary developmental editor, Betsy Thorpe, uh, who used to be in New York with some of the big publishing houses, but got tired of the New York City rat race and, and came home to Charlotte and, and yes. does editing here. Um, with her help and, and a good a good copy editor and a good proofreader, um, we were able to cobble together a, a book. And this isn't the only thing you've written, right? You also write in other ways. Well, I I, I did a um, I did a weekly blog for okay. four years. Okay. Called Choices Do Matter, and um that blog is still out there it's it's on the internet you can search it and find all the stories but there are all sorts of stories where i made a particular choice in my life and that turned out to either be a good choice or a bad choice okay. and 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 then i talk about why and then the format of that blog was t 
to start a conversation. So the idea was, this is what I did. What would you have done? And mm -hmm. I was able to engage the, the reader that way. So, Bruce, take me to the moment when the doorbell rings, there's a box outside the front door, and your book has arrived. And that moment you get to open that and pull that out of the box for the first time. Tell me how that felt for you as an author. I'll just give you one word, and that's surreal. Mm. Um, it's as though you have to pinch yourself and say, you know, that, you know I mean, still to this day. Um, you know, it's. I know. I can I can pick this up and and flip anywhere and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what happened. Yeah. When you first pulled the book out to show me the 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 cover there, I see you. After you showed me the book, you kind of held it to yourself as you were talking. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, but I was watching, and you're holding it like that. embracing it. And I'm like, I love I love looking and watching an author with their book because that. There's a, there's some pride there. There's this yeah. is my story, and we talked about yeah. that before we hit record. Yeah. Bruce, tell me, do you feel that we all have a story, and it's just we have to un, just write the book, write the story, share the story. Do you think that we all have a story to share? Oh, I I I think absolutely everybody has a story, and they and they really have more than one. Um, Some people are more open than other people. Um, and so how you go about sharing it and who you share your story with that becomes a very personal decision that everybody has to make on their own. Right. Um, I think there's a certain amount of legacy in storytelling. I, I think that um, you would want your children and and their children to understand something about you. Um, some people feel that way, but maybe not everybody. Um, so I, I think everybody certainly has a story. Then they have to decide who do they want to tell it to. Right. Do they want to tell it to only close family members or the whole world? Um, and and then they just have to sit out and tell it. Um, and as we talked a little bit before before we started on the air, um, I think the important part is to not just tell the who, what, when, and where, and why. That's sort of a chronological history. I was born, I went to school, I got married, I died. Um, yeah. You know, it's the events along the way that really matter because all of our lives are going to have good things and bad things in them. That's just how it is. But the real story is in how you, how someone dealt with those things that they were handed. Um, what they do next, that's what matters. That's the story of transition or transformation. And I think that's what readers want to hear. And I think that's what your legacy is, is to let your offspring understand what you thought about and, and how you changed over the years. You tell me tell me how your families responded to the book. Um, well, they were all very supportive, for one. Um, I didn't say anything bad about anybody. <laughs> um, so, so that helped. There's a whole... If you're going to write a memoir that's really critical of your family, you you need to think about either how you're going to do that or or, yeah. or talk to some people ahead of time. But um, but I didn't have that challenge, so um, they were very supportive. Um, they they've all read either all of it or parts of it before it was ever printed. Um, one of our granddaughters. Uh, was very helpful. She she's the one that I was too slow getting the story started, hmm. and she said, "Granddaddy, I can't. I ain't gonna keep up with this. You got to get going faster." And so that's when the whole opening got got reduced down to four the first four paragraphs. And so she's the one to thank for that. So they all have little editing roles in there somewhere. Nice. So it's a family project then, really. 
I'm it's, sorry? It's, it's the whole family joining together. To oh, help it you is, with this, right? I think it is. I think yeah. it is. And, 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 and especially if our stories involve family, um, then I, I think they do play a role. And, and all of them are in there. Our son argues that he doesn't get a big enough part, but uh, I told him <laughs> I told him maybe the next book will there worry you go. about that. Yeah. You've, we've written this one now that we we're, we're all eagerly waiting book number two. Um, any tips from your perspective, Bruce, for a new author that's listening to us talk right now? They haven't written their book. Maybe they're they're in a season of their life where, you know, they're thinking, ah. Who wants to hear from me? Who wants to hear my story? You know, maybe I'm. Maybe they're saying this is just terrible. I'm too old to do this, Bruce. What mm -hmm. would you say to an author that just hasn't started, but he needs a little gentle nudge to write yeah. that book? Yeah. Well, f well, first you're not too old, and even <laughs> if you, even if your hand shakes and you can't hold a pen very well, there, you know, there are ways to get around to all of that. So it's it's certainly possible to do. Um, I think the the one mistake, and, and I was certainly guilty of this at, at first, is trying to polish as you go along rather than simply finishing the story. Right. Uh, I, I've, I've decided that, that I write best when I simply finish the story. So I can say, oh, here's the start, here's the end. Then go back and polish what I've written, but if I but if I only write the first chapter and I spend months polishing that first chapter, I get worn out before I ever go to the second chapter. Right. And and it, and the the case I just described to you when my granddaughter said Granddaddy started faster, all of that got thrown away. So all of my polish what didn't do any good because <laughs> we ended up not using it. So get the story down. And then worry about polishing it later would be my advice to somebody. At least that way you can say, okay, I've finished the first draft. Mm -hmm. um, now I'll go back and polish it. Um, and just, you know, just commit to write a little bit every day, every week, whatever, whatever works for you. Um, and uh, it, before you know it, it's done. And um, we all have... We, we all tell stories that almost the rest of the family can, could complete for us, I think. Um, how we met our spouse, um, uh, what it was like the day our first child was born. You know, all of mm. these events that, in your life. Um, we've told that story over and over and over. So write those stories. You know those stories very well, so write them down. Then spread those all out and say, well, how can we put that together? Maybe not chronologically, but maybe this way works. So this way works. And then we start stringing that together with transitions. And before we know it, we've got a, a complete story. I love it. So, Bruce, the title of our podcast is going to refer to your book. And there's going to be com people coming to this podcast who have a family member who, or they themselves are struggling with a health issue, maybe something serious like yours was very serious that had to be dealt with right away. Um, and they're coming to this episode for some inspiration from you on some of the darkest days when you get bad medical news the way you did. Is there any, what kind of hope can you offer to somebody listening who is be, who's just received some pretty bad news medically and they're looking for a little bit of inspiration from your perspective? How do you mm. go through those dark days? What kind of things could you offer to us? Yeah. Um, the thing that comes to mind, I guess, is to trust the process and trust the favorable outcome. Um, because once once you do give up hope, you've you've given up everything. So um, I've thought a lot about privileges, and I, I actually think hope 
may be the single greatest privilege any of us have. Mm. Um, because when hope goes, everything goes with it. Um, now, as to there's there's one particular scene in this story uh, where I'm at the the absolute lowest bottom. I'm <laughs> I'm ready to hang it up. Um, and I don't mean that in a suicidal way. I'm mm, just like yeah. this. Obviously, doesn't end well. You know, yeah. I was I was suffering, and I'm I make the statement: Is it strength that brings hope, or is it hope that brings strength? Mm. And to me, it's hope that brings strength. So as long as you can keep hoping, then you can be strong, and you can get through it. So that that becomes hope being the ultimate privilege, um, in a good way. Um, and I, I guess I guess what I would say to anybody going through anything, any dark time, mm-hmm. is that whether it's a predestined act of God or just some sort of fate. Bad things do happen. They always have and they always will. Mm -hmm. And it's what happens next that matters. And so that's the part you can have a role in. You have no role in how you got to this bottom. But you do have a role in how you come out of it. And that's where the hope is. Sure. That's an amazing insight, Bruce. And those, those words come with a lot of weight with what you've lived and what you've learned and the lessons that have been put in front of you. And then to share this all in your book with us, it's, it's like a gift to us from you. And I really, I really enjoy that. I think that is powerful that you can take your story and help other people with it. Thank you. So Bruce, what are you hoping for when someone goes and purchases the book at their local store or they buy it online or something and they the book arrives at their home like it arrived at your home what are you hoping for the reader as they take that book into their home and and start reading it what do you really what would you like to say to a reader that's going to read your book for the first time i guess my hope dave would be that if they just find one thing in there that resonates and one thing that they can make their own, then it's been a success. Um, If every reader will take something different from the book, I I understand that. And, um, And that's how it should be. And the book will, for some people, it will only hit them on a superficial level. Um, but there are many, many places in the book that go much deeper than that, like the the one I just described of, of does strength give hope or hope give mm-hmm. strength. That was great, yeah. There are, some, there are a lot of really pretty weighty things in the book like that, and some people will get that, some people won't. Um, and And all of that's okay, but as long as as long as a reader takes something away from the story and, and feels some value, then I have then I've provided value and that's that's the reason to put it out there. And would that be your measuring stick of a quote successful book? Is that it's somebody one, was impacted? One person. One person. Two is a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> one I'm happy. Yeah. I get two, that's a bonus. Well, Bruce, I'm going to have links in the show notes for the episode so people can go right to your book and purchase the book. I would encourage people as well, if you're going to purchase the book online, to make sure that you leave Bruce a review of the book, because that always helps new authors to to have more people see the book and and want to buy the book. And having the podcast is nice because now we get to connect with you and hear your voice and hear your heart and how proud you are of this great new book. Uh, I'm just so happy that you have time, Bruce, to to share with us today and be part of our podcast. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dave, and thanks for having me on. 
This is great. So everyone, please go check out all the information in the show notes on my new friend, Bruce. And, um, and we're so happy to have you here, Bruce. Thank you for being part of living the next chapter. And we're looking forward thank to you. your next chapter, Bruce, yeah, whatever that you. is. And I'm excited yeah. to hear what that's going to be. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for being part of living the next chapter. Hey, look at we're we're having such a great time talking to authors around the world. If you are an author and you would like to be on this very show, I would love to talk to you. Livingthenextchapter.com, livingthenextchapter.com, living the next chapter dot com is the best way to get in touch with us. There you'll find our social media and blah, 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 la di da and such. You, author, soon-to-be author, new author, currently writing your book author, published author, we need you here. The seat's empty, microphone set up, we're waiting for you. Livingthenextchapter.com. We would love to have you on the podcast. Yeah, I am talking. I'm talking to you. Yeah, you should be here. We'll see you at livingthenextchapter.com. Mind Shift Power Podcast, the podcast for teenagers and those who work with them. There's a huge problem in America today. There's a very large disconnect between teenagers and the adults who work with them. I'm looking to bridge that gap with real, raw, honest conversation, not held back by the chains of political correctness. You cannot solve a problem you do not understand. Want to understand teenagers today? Listen to this podcast. This podcast is for teens in the U.S. and Canada. To learn more, go to FatimaBay.com slash podcast, or just look for MindShift Power Podcast on any listening platform. I look forward to you being a faithful listener.